ഹൈലമ്മ <coughs> This is portion of the ayah from Surah Kahf, the ayah number 29. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling and making one thing very clear. And that is through His Prophet, He is giving out a message to entire humanity. And the message goes out like this, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Tell them that the ultimate truth comes only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the ultimate truth. It doesn't matter how much philosophy you exert, how much logic you exert. The final truth is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals. Now that is a very important ayah because in these times that you're living in, the rationalism, logic, philosophy... is once again taking a big turn and is exploiting human brain. Something like this happened 2,000 some years ago too. In the Romans times, in the Greeks time, when philosophy was out there and it was not a guided philosophy. Even in these times, a lot of the Muslims are getting affected by the philosophy and logic coming from non-believers because these believers don't have knowledge. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say his philosophy is bad. Doesn't say his logic is bad. Doesn't say his rationalism is bad. But everything has to be directed. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a ground rule. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ The guidance comes from your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that has been the message since Adam alayhi salam had been sent down on the planet earth. That was the message. فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَىٰ When the guidance come to, me from, to you from me, فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَىٰ يَفَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And then the one who are going to pick that guidance, they don't have to worry about it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when the guidance has come, you have seen what the right message is, now it is your choice. You are going to make a choice. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنَ You make a choice if you want to believe. وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ And whoever wishes to not believe, okay, go ahead. But remember, مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ One day, you will be held responsible for the choices you made. So, choice and decision-making, let me use a little heavy word, decision-making is very, very important. You know these CEOs in the company, they get paid millions of dollars And they get these bonus packages. They're not the most educated people on the face of earth. They're not. A Harvard professor is more educated than most of these CEOs. But they are made a lot of money for making decisions. Because the decision that they make can make or break world's economy. can make or break trillion dollars of trades, billions of dollars of trade, their decision can create many million employments or could put, put millions of people out of job. We've seen these kind of decisions being made at corporations where they started losing money because somebody who couldn't make wise decisions came in power. It's not like the person was not smart. The person didn't make the good decision. Let's take an example. J.C. Penney, right here. There were times, two, three years, J.C. Penney was going down the drain because they hired somebody from Apple. He was of the mindset that whatever we have, that's the best thing on the face of earth. We do not need to lower our price. 
give out coupons. We do not need to bring the customers. Our brand is so that the customers will come. So he stopped all of these things. As a result, people stopped going to JCPenney. And their sales went dropping. And there was no coming back. He tried convincing the board members, it will come back because people will realize they, they, were, they were getting a better deal. Our prices are so low. But what happened? He was sent out. New person came back in and then he had to put that JCPenney culture back in the JCPenney shops. And he started reviving some of the old themes of JCPenney which was if you buy one thing for a full price you get the other one for a penny. So he just tried to bring, bring people in. So the decision making is very important at a corporation level at an individual level, at a family level. Sometimes we make decisions for our families. Sometimes those are emotional decisions and it hurts everybody. Sometimes those are wise decisions and everybody excels. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His Prophet has taught us many things which are called hadith, the word of the Prophet. And the Prophet said, you all are like shepherds. And you all have responsibilities to bear. Just make sure that you make a right decision. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in Surah Baqarah, La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion in religion. There is no force in religion. There is no pressure in religion. You cannot use a stick and start hitting people to believe. The Prophet was getting overburdened in the Makkan period. Said, Why are these people not listening to me? Why are they not believing? I have the best of the best message on the face of the planet earth. Why are they not willing to understand? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that's not your job. That is not your job to make them believe. That's my job. Your job is to deliver the message. That's why you are a messenger. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَخِعٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ يَسَفَىٰ Surah Al-Kahf where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you are overburdening yourself that these people are not believing. Forget about them. You just deliver the message. Those who want to believe will believe. لَا إِكْرَاهَ فِي الدِّينِ And what is the next part of this ayah? قَدْ تَبَيَّنَ الرُّشْدُ مِنَ الْغَيْنِ As the right path have been made very clearly open from the wrong path. Everybody knows what is right and wrong now. Now it's their decision to make. Do you think the people of Quraysh who were listening to the Quran, they did not understand Arabic? They understood Arabic far better than most of the Arabs because the Quran was in their dialect. You would be surprised to hear that a lot of these people will go and listen to Quran in hiding at night time when the Prophet would recite, but they wouldn't tell each other. And then there were times when the road crossed and they ran into each other like, what are you doing? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Oh, I came to listen to Prophet. This is so beautiful. But well, I'm not going to come tomorrow. But they all showed up tomorrow again. What did Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu did? When he saw Prophet praying in the, near the Kaaba on the wall between Hajar Aswad and uh, the Rukan which is towards the Yemen. The Prophet used to pray on that side because if you pray on that side you can put Kaaba in between and your direction is towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. The Bayt Al-Maqdas. So both Kaaba can come in between if you pray on that side. So in the Makkan period, he was asked to pray towards Bayt al-Maqdas. So he, he specifically used to pray in that location so that both Kaabas can come in line. So Umar radiallahu anhu at night time sneaked in that curtain or the cover of the Kaaba and moved very closely to the Prophet so he could listen what the Prophet was reciting. And now Umar is at a point where the Prophet is reciting the ayahs from the Qur'an and Umar is thinking and the Qur'an is responding to what Umar is thinking. And Umar is thinking that, oh my God, what a beautiful poetry. And the Qur'an is saying in the same surah, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ 
And Allah gets amazed. He said, how does he know what I'm thinking? He got to be a fortune teller. He must be a kahin. And the Quran says, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ And then when the Prophet left, Umar also sneaked out. And what convinced Umar was another ayah of the Quran as the narration brings. That when he went to the house of his sister Fatima, and he asked Fatima, show me what you and your husband were reading, she was reluctant. She said, you're not pure. Go and first get purified. Take a shower, come back. Then I'm going to give you what I was reading. In one narration it says, she was reading Surah Taha. When Umar started reading, because he was among those people who could read and write in Arabia, when he came to the ayah, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu felt trembled. He felt as if this ayah was for him. Where Allah is saying, Innani ana Allah. Indeed, I am the Allah. La ilaha illa ana. There is nobody to be worshipped but me. Fa'bud me. So worship me. And that was the last nail in the coffin. With kufr left behind. And who's a brand new Umar. He said, I want to go and meet the Prophet. And the Khabbab ibn Arad, who was in the same house, he said, Oh Umar, I heard Prophet made dua for you or Aba Jahal. Looks like the Prophet's dua has been accepted in your favor. And Umar is thinking, Oh my God, will Prophet meet me at this time of the day when it's so hot in Mecca, daytime when people take rest? And Khabbab is saying, Umar, he is not a king. He's the prophet of God. He will meet anyone, anytime, anywhere. Because his job is to deliver the message. So Umar made a decision which made him Umar ibn al-Khattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa to Abu Bakr. Because he came after Abu Bakr. Second Khalifa of Mu'mineen. He was among the Khalifa to Rashid. He was the minister of the Prophet. And the Prophet said, I was, I've been given four ministers. Two on the face of earth and two in the heavens. My two ministers over here are Abu Bakr and Umar. And the companions report the Bukhari and Muslim and all books of hadith are, are filled with these hadith that the Prophet would say a narration and would say, Abu Bakr and Umar will agree with me on this, and none of them would be present. That's how he trusted them. And this was Umar we are talking about. He made a decision. So decision making is very, very important. I'm going to give you another incident. Some of you might have heard of this name, some of you might not have heard of this name. Fudayl ibn Ayaz, a great muhaddis of his time. A great pious person. He was the student of the Tabi'een. So he's from Taba Tabi'een. He lived in the second century of Islamic history. This guy was a robber. He himself alone was such a horrible robber that he would loot the whole caravan. People were scared going through the route of Fulayl ibn Ayyad. And it's a funny story. He was a young guy, and he had a girlfriend. I'm like, really? Back then, yeah. And every time he would take something out, he would go and give her the best of the best. But he would sneak out in the city at the night time. So he made that decision to go and meet her once. And this is where he's trying to sneak in her house when everybody's sleeping, the whole city is sleeping, the whole town is sleeping, so nobody catches him because... Otherwise, he will be caught and put in prison and maybe beheaded. So while he's waiting, he listens an ayah of Quran. And that ayah changed him. And the ayah was, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَى قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Has the time not come for the believers? That the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shake their hearts 
And he was moved. He said, Al-an al This is the time, O oh Lord. I leave behind my old ways. He went to the masjid. He did the wudu. Prayed two rak'at of repentance. And he started going around looking for people that he could recognize and recall that he might have hurt through his old ways. He paid them money, tried to convince them to forgive him. And this was the guy who is the muhaddith of his times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had his mercy on him that the books of hadith, if you look at the chain of narration, you will find his name among the early narrators. An'an Fudayl ibn Ayyad An, and you will find that name right there. This is the guy who became the teacher of the teachers of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. This is the guy who became the teacher of Sir Saqati, Ibrahim bin Adham. These are big names, huge names, and he was their teacher. The teacher of Imam Ahmad that he was the teacher of was Bishr al-Hafi. Bishr al-Hafi was the teacher of Imam Ahmad where Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal used to go to, to gain the knowledge of, knowledge of tazkiyah to nafs, the cleansing of the soul. And he's the guy who became the friends of the people like Abdullah ibn Mubarak who was such a great person in the field of hadith that in his times he used to be called the Amir al-Mu'mineen of hadith. That's the highest title you can gain in the field of hadith. Like Imam Bukhari was the Amir al-Mu'mineen in the field of hadith in his times. So he became from a robber that people were scared of through the process of repentance and fixing himself to a place where he's narrating hadith it takes hard work. It takes a lot of humbling down. Now think about it. He's going to all those people asking repentance. Please forgive me, I hurt you. Please forgive me, I took stuff from you. Whatever I have, take it. Some people forgave him. Some people said, okay, give me some money. But itself takes a lot of humbleness. How many of us could dare to do that? Just think about it. How many of us could dare to do that? Just go to two people in our life that we have hurt and ask forgiveness. It's hard, but it humbles you down. Because he took the path. When he made a choice, he said, I will do everything to stick to that choice. It is the choice that you have to make and stick to it. But the problem is we don't make good choices sometimes. And when you realize, the moment you realize that my choice was bad, Backtrack. Repent. Now pick a better choice. For the son of Adam, the repentance doors are open till he dies. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have seen some horrible people turn around. The magicians at the time of Moses, they had a turning around period. There was a time when they made a decision, no more. And it was the Fir'aun who said, I will cut your hands. And he did. He did it. But they stood their grounds. Because they said, We have believed in the Lord of Moses and Aaron. At the same time, there was a guy with Moses, Samari. He was sticking with Moses. And that was the guy who was responsible for leading thousands of the children of Israel astray by making them worship a cow that he created. And when Moses caught him, he said, why did you do that? He said, because that pleased me. He's hanging out with the prophet but not getting guided. And there are some magicians who are having one-on-one -on -one interaction with the prophet once and they're getting guided. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the decision lies in my hand. I shall decide because I am the Maliki Yawm deen Your job is to make a good decision, the right decision. Surat al-Mustaqeem doesn't mean it will be a straight line. It's a right path. That right path could have curves, 
turns, ups, downs, humps, under construction roads closed. There will be some hurdles. It's Surat al Mustaqim, it's not easy. If it was so easy, then everybody will take it, right? So what is not so easy about it? It is easy for those who come to a point that I have made a decision to submit. That's the thing. Am I willing to submit? I want to be a Muslim and I want to become a mu'min. And there were people who walked into the presence of the Prophet and said, we have come and believed. We are the believers. And Allah said, tell them you are not at the state of mu'min yet. You're just a Muslim. So don't tell the Prophet that as if you have done a favor accepting Islam. And this is a big ayah for us. We need to go back and see, am I praying as if at the back of my hand, am I favoring anybody? Or am I praying because I'm submitted? Why am I doing, is this a ritual coming here every Friday? Is it a ritual praying five times a day, fasting 30 days, going for hajj, praying zakah, paying zakah? Is this all ritual? Or are there any meanings behind these words and actions? Somebody has to make a decision. Somebody has to make a choice. And that will be us. Nobody else will going to come from outside and fix our problems. We got to fix our own problems. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم